be seated, but stay awake. <laughs> Don't get too comfortable. I hope you are fully caffeinated today because we're going to do a deep dive uh, on this parable today. As God's people, we are, we take seriously what God's word has to say about all things. When it comes to matters of eternity, we know that the destiny of some will be heaven, the destiny of others will be hell. Now, when we love people, the right response is that we're concerned for those who will not spend eternity with us in heaven. By the way, if you did not get a handout today, if you would raise your hand, if you want one, Rick is happy to help you. You're going to need one today. There's a lot in here and uh, a lot of writing. So. We struggle with the salvation status of some people due to not seeing the results of fruit we expect to see. We love them, and we want their best. We also struggle with those who profess to be a child of God, but live apparent fruitless lives. Jesus said, as recorded in John 10, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly, more abundantly. There are so many Christians who are living substandard Christian lives. And that's a concern because they are not, in the words of the army, being all they can be. And they're certainly not all that God wants them to be and do. And that's a concern. As we move closer to the Word of God and we understand it and we apply it, it helps us to navigate our lives. But not everybody is there where they are committed to wanting to understand and to obey and live fruitful Christian lives. This creates a problem for us because we know people are not living the life that God has for them. We struggle with repeatedly sharing the gospel and other biblical truth with loved ones and not seeing it embraced by them. There are people that you know, people who are in your family, people in your neighborhood, people that you've worked with, that you have tried to share the word of God with, and they just will not embrace it. And because you love them, you go back to them over and over again because you want them to understand so that they can live the way God wants them to live and they can experience the abundant life that Jesus came to give them. But it, it causes us heartache when we see this. What we're going to see today is that people respond to the Word of God in different ways. Now, we've all seen this. We know people who don't respond to the gospel message at all. Even after repeatedly hearing the gospel, they do not respond. There are other people who respond, but they're not serious about their Christian life. There are people who are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, who are dynamos for Christ. There are all kinds of peoples, all kinds of hearers, and their response to the Word of God. Now, there are reasons why God's Word does and does not take root in all people. We're going to see that today. And there are differing levels of fruitfulness for differing people. And even in different seasons, there are, there's more fruit bearing than in other times, in other seasons of life. This is just spiritual fruit. This is just the way it is. But we still desire to see people living in obedience to the Word of God, 
to take it on, to apply it, and to produce spiritual fruit in their lives. So today we're going to look at a familiar parable, a, par a story about seed and soils. And I just want to give you this opening statement, and I will unpack this statement as I go along. People respond in different ways to the Word of God. Our mission is to sow the seed, not to evaluate the fruit. We are lousy fruit inspectors. We are. That is way above our pay grade. God alone is the fruit inspector. Our responsibility is to sow the word of God into people's lives. So, if you will, turn with me to Luke chapter 8. I'll be reading today. Too bad Gary's not here because I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. That's his, his well-worn Bible. It's a New American Standard. Beginning in verse 4, we hear these words. When a large crowd was coming together, and those from the very cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable, he referring to Jesus. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away. It withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now that's a significant statement. I want you to remember that by what follows here. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said to them, to you, who's he referring to? The disciples. To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest it is in parables. So that, he's quoting from Isaiah here, Isaiah 6, seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those besides the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in the time of temptation, fall away. The seed which fell upon the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, and hold it fast, and bear fruit with perseverance. Now, it's important that we understand that we're going to go through an inductive Bible study method of observation, interpretation, correlation, and application. We must do each step in the right order. And when we come to the Word of God, we want to come with a blank piece of paper saying, what does it say? This is one of the hardest things for us to do. Um, I, I struggled with my men's discipleship groups in trying to teach them observation. They want to immediately jump to interpretation. I said, no, no, no. What does it factually tell us? We start there. We interpret after that. So let's look at the observation. But before we do that, let me just give you the context for this parable. Jesus is explaining the four different responses people have 
to hearing the word of God. Verses 9 and 10 help us again understand the nature of parables. Remember we saw this. Parables have two purposes. To reveal spiritual truth to some, to those that has been granted, and to hide spiritual truth from others. And this is related to what Jesus says here, the mysteries of the kingdom of God. The disciples were allowed to have truth revealed to them, while others were not allowed to understand it. He clarifies this by explaining the interpretation of the parable to the disciples to ensure that they understand it. This is the context around everything that we see in this parable. Now the point is this. People have different responses to the word of God regarding the mysteries of God's kingdom. God grants to some the ability to see, hear, and understand the gospel, leading to salvation and fruitfulness. To others, spiritual truth is hidden from them. So now we do observation. What do we see? In verse 4, Jesus chooses to speak via a parable when a large crowd from various cities come to encounter him. Well, now when we look and compare this with Mark's version and Matthew's version of this situation, they tell us that Jesus got on a boat and went out a little bit into the water. We assume that his disciples would have been in the boat with him. So here he is in this natural amphitheater type of a setting. He's telling this story from a boat a little bit offshore, and you know how when you talk at the beach, your, your voice kind of carries. And so this is, this is carried so that they can hear what he's going to say. The sower went out to sow his seed. Now this raises a question. Is this just the sower in the story? Or is Jesus referring to himself as the sower? Because Jesus went about sowing the word of God everywhere he went. I don't know. It's a good question. But in the story, the sower went out to sow his seed. The seed sowed on the road, this is the first kind of a soil, was trampled underfoot and eaten by birds. Why in the world would there have been seed sown on the road? It's a good question. Would any of you plant, try to throw seed on a sidewalk? Of course not, right? You know it's not going to grow. But in this culture, when people would uh, sow their seeds, they would just sow it everywhere. They would sow it. So some of it fell on a harder soil, while others fell in different kinds of soils. So that's what's going on here. In the second example, other seed fell on rocky soil. It sprouted, but withered away due to lack of moisture. <laughs> I don't know about you. But our plants and flowers are doing this. You know what? Lack of moisture. Susan said, honey, you got to get that, that hose hooked back up again. Our old holes burst in half. And so I had to replace it. She says, it's not going to rain. i got to water. we got tomato plants that are like this. Our beautiful flowers. But you water them, you can perk them back up again. But this is what's happening. They have no moisture. Okay? Verse 7, other seed fell among thorns, and it grew up, but it was choked out. The plants choked out the growth. In verse 8a, the first part of verse 8, still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a hundredfold crop. Matthew and Mark say a hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold, indicating even different degrees of fruitfulness. But this just says, as much as a hundredfold crop. In 8b, Jesus directs all hearers to listen to these words. If you have ears to hear, hear what I'm saying. Now to us, that's like, okay, what does that mean? It means if you have hear, ears and you have the ability to understand this spiritual truth, listen to it. That's what he's talking about. We already know the disciples had been granted ears to hear and understand. But his disciples still ask, 
for the interpretation of the parable. So Jesus gives it to them. He explained the secrets of God's kingdom had been given to them, granted to them to understand. But to others, he spoke in mere parables that they could not understand. To them, it was just a good story and nothing more. A secular story, but to others, it was a secular story with spiritual significance. So that in their hearing, they may not understand. This is what Jesus tells us. And then he launches into, okay, here's the interpretation of what this means. In verse 11, he's very clear. The seed is the word of God. The word of God. What is the seed? The word of God. Now, when we commonly read this, we assume that means the gospel only. But this is broader than that. This is all the word of God when it goes out. Remember, we're talking about principles about the kingdom of God. And there are people that are at different stages in, in the kingdom. Those who are outside of the kingdom, those that are in there that are not living fruitful lives. And there are those who are abundantly fruitful. The unbelievers in this first category and unsaved hear it. But they don't respond. Why? Because the devil takes away the word from their hearts. We'll look at some of the references about this in just a moment. The second soil. The rootless hearers respond initially with joy, but they fall away in time of testing. Now we're going to need to understand what fall away means and what time of testing means. We'll revisit that in just a moment. The fruitless hearers are fruitless because they're being choked out by the worries, riches, and pleasures of life. And the fruitful hearers, by contrast, he says, but, so he's showing a strong contrast, the fruitful hearers hear with an honest and good heart, hold fast, and persevere in fruit bearing. Whenever we interpret scripture, we must be careful of certain common errors. I want to identify four common errors that we must avoid. And it's just built into us. And so we need to say these out loud and understand what they are. Here's the first one. We must avoid the tendency to read into the text what is not actually stated in the text. This text doesn't specifically, for example, say that the seed is being the gospel. It is the gospel, but it's more than the gospel. We know that because of what we see in verse 10. So, this is a very common parable that you have heard, taught, and you've read, and you just always make certain basic assumptions. <clears throat> Rather than coming at the text with fresh eyes, saying, okay, I want to go back and look at this, brand new, fresh, and make sure I know what it's saying. In this case, it's, this is a very important mistake that people typically fall into. Number two, we must be honest and discern what the text is actually saying and not what we want it to say to agree with a preconceived notion or theology. You see, what we do is we take texts that really are not clear, but they appear on the surface or we've hear them, hear, heard them taught that support a particular theological position and we just assume that's the right thing. But in actuality, some texts are not good proof texts for a particular theological position. And we have to be honest enough to say, this is not the best text to try and support this position. Even if you hold that position, we have to be honest enough to say, this is not a very clear <coughs> reference to support that position. The third one is this. We must avoid automatically assuming 
that there cannot be sound alternative interpretations to the biblical text. We assume our position is right, and so we refuse to even listen to any other possible interpretations. This is folly. And here's why it's folly. Because we, we must avoid accepting, accepting without question a favorite Bible commentary, their a favorite Bible commentator's interpretation, or a particular pastor, or a writer's interpretation. <coughs> Godly scholars disagree with one another on many points of interpretation. I've heard people say this before. Well, don't you trust those so-and-so? They're a very brilliant person. And I would say yes. But there are other brilliant biblical scholars who are honest who disagree with that person. I've shared with you in the past that the seminary I went to, there were three professors that in a book presented their position on the timing of the rapture. And then the other two would critique that view. Now these three men worked on the same staff together. They respected each other as scholars, but they disagreed. Because when you read the first one, you said, that's it. That's the biblical case. And then you read their critiques and you went, oh, they raised some very good questions here. Then you read the second one. You said, ah, that's it. Until you read the critiques. And you said, oh, now I'm really confused. By the time you get to the third one, you go, okay, I'm not going to just accept this uh, lock, stock, and barrel. But you read it, and then you read the critiques. But here's the thing. They all three are godly men. They're all three high scholarly people who've studied and have more degrees than a thermometer, <laughs> who are way above me in their understanding, and they don't agree. I can't tell you what that did for me. That, that caused me to have an open mind on secondary issues. Not primary issues, but secondary issues. So these are the errors we must avoid. So we must come to a text and say, okay, well, I'm going to look, look at this as if I'm looking at it for the first time. And make sure I'm not putting a bias into what I want it to say for whatever reason. I've heard people say before, well, this is what David Jeremiah says. This is what John MacArthur says. This is what Wayne Grudem says. This is what Charles Ryrie says. This is what Chuck Swindoll says. As if every single word coming out of their mouth must be 100% Accurate. Now, I believe in their minds, they've studied it and they've come to different conclusions. If you accept, listen, if you've got ears to hear, hear. If you accept everything that any one commentator says, you are not being honest and looking at it for yourself. There are scholars that I respect that I disagree with. But on a lot of their topics, they go, man, they are they're right on with this. They are right on with this. I want to read conflicting views to sharpen what my understanding should be. So when I come to a text, I try to come to it unbiased as much as I can. I want to tell you, before I get into this today, I spent two weeks working on this message. I have consulted numerous commentaries. I've looked at the Greek New Testament. I've looked at Greek lexicons. I've studied meanings of these Greek words and verbs that help us understand what's being said here. I've consulted with five pastors that I regard highly because I know I'm responsible. I will be judged on my teaching. So I do not go into this flippantly or capriciously at all. But I want to share with you some things that you've probably never even thought about before in this text we're going to get into. So, if you have ears to hear, listen. The key to understanding the parable, I really think it comes down to verses 9 and 10. 
His disciples began questioning him as to what the parable meant. And he said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest it is in parables. So that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now, in Matthew's version of this account, oh my, he, numerous verses to this whole thing about this quote from Isaiah. He goes into much greater depth. When he's talking about mysteries of the kingdom of God, he's not only talking about salvation. He's talking about more than salvation. Spiritual principles related to entering through salvation the kingdom of God, and operating within it through understanding, obeying, and producing results or spiritual fruit, which brings honor to the king. I believe this is the bigger, greater meaning of what we need to understand as we approach this, this whole parable and understand it clearly. This, I believe, is the main issue. People will respond in different ways to the mysteries of God's kingdom. If you understand the word of God, if you and I understand the word of God and have responded to the gospel and other biblical truth, consider yourself blessed by God to be granted to be able to understand and accept it and then responsibly work to produce more spiritual fruit. That's what we need to do. You know, it's amazing to me how you can share a parable with some people. Really, this is, I've seen this happen with non-Christians, and they, they, I have no clue what the world that's talking about. And I'm going, you're kidding. It's obvious what he's, he's referring to here. They don't get it. Evidence. I've seen this in my own ministry, that this is nonetheless true. The secondary issue Secondary issue is this. Which of the four types of hearers are not to be regarded as believers and which are not? You see, what we want to do is make that the primary issue. That's not the primary issue. It's a secondary issue. And it's a theoretical debate that we have within ourselves that we can do nothing about because we can't control this. God alone knows whether someone is a believer. So this is a speculative, theoretical debate defended by solid, godly Bible students throughout the ages holding differing views. This is not a new debate. The debate only gets us chasing our tails unproductively instead of productively focusing on our sowing God's word among people, the gods of the gospel seed through salvation, and then nurturing believers so that we see applicational, fruitful growth. It does us no good to try and say, now that guy is not a believer because we don't know whether that guy is a believer. And when we say, I've looked at his fruit, and I know he's not a believer, we are being incredibly arrogant to do that. We don't know. It can only be speculated because none of us is adequately equipped to definitively determine the true measure of necessary fruit, either quantity or quality, which would authenticate genuine saving faith. God alone understands this. And we've got to let God be God and let God sort that out. Our job is to be the messenger, to be the seed sower, to sow the word of God and leave those results to God. And that's hard because we want to control things. Why? Because we love people and we want to see them come to faith in Christ and we want to see them grow as a believer. But even with our most diligent efforts, it still doesn't happen sometimes. That's where we have to leave it up to the Holy Spirit to convict, for God to draw those people to himself. You and I, I really believe this, 
We'll be very surprised to learn that we will see some people in heaven that we had erroneously considered as non-Christians on this side of eternity. What are you doing here? Well, I trusted Jesus as my Savior. Really? But may they never say, what are you doing here? <laughs> I never thought I'd see you here. You see, we don't know. We just don't know. So why do we commonly think that we can accurately measure the true spiritual condition of anyone? We can't. We're just not equipped to do that. So, you want to get into this, so let's get into it. As I said, I have done a very, very deep dive on this. And I am thoroughly convinced in my mind this is the interpretation. You're welcome to disagree. We're based on my study, and I'll share with you why in just a moment. The first example clearly seems to indicate that this is an unbeliever or an unsaved person. It says the devil takes the word away from this person. They, they do not believe. There's no belief there. Now, what's interesting is Paul, as he's making his defense, is reflecting back on his conversion experience, and he's sharing this, and he's saying, when he was still Saul, remember when Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That's the account that he's talking about. He was appointed by God, and this is what it says in, in Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes, he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Amen. Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Paul was to attempt to try and open the eyes of those who would have the ability to see how they could escape the dominion of Satan. That was the kingdom that he was operating within before he came to Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, read this with me. The God of this, read it with me. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Satan blinds the eyes. He blinds the minds so that they cannot understand the gospel. You see, the last thing Satan wants is for someone to leave his dominion and to go into the kingdom of God. But if they do, then he's going to do everything he can to make you unfruitful and miserable while you're inside the kingdom. He wants you to be ineffective. He doesn't want you sowing seed of the word of God with others, lest they hear and understand and believe and leave his dominion. So he stops those efforts. He tries to stop those efforts. So this example seems to be without question. This soil represents the person who's not a believer. Now, soils two and three are the controversial ones. And this is where I'll spend the majority of my time. The fourth example seems there's universal agreement on. This is a person who's a fruitful Christian. But two and three are the ones where people differ. The second example seems to indicate that their belief was shallow. Notice it says they did have belief. The result is literally they continually fall away or withdraw at or yield to temptation. Now what's interesting is this idea of falling away, we have to define it because I know what we normally think that means. It means they've fallen away from the faith, the way that it's used in 1 Timothy. It's the same Greek word, aphistomy, very same word. It is used 14 times in the New Testament. 11 of those times it is used by Luke. Luke's Gospel and the Book of Acts. So this is a word he likes to use. This word is an interesting word because it can mean fall away, it can mean withdraw from, 
abandon. And the tense of this verb is very important because it doesn't mean a one-time event. It means they continuously fall away, continuously walk away or withdraw. That's important. If it's, uh, of these usages, what we have, 11 times, 11 times this, I even wrote this down because I did not want to mess this up. 11 times this verb is used in the past tense. In English, it would be like this. When Joe's friends asked him to go last Friday to go bungee jumping, he told them, I don't want to go. That was a past, a singular past event. That's what this verb tense means. Okay, that's the majority of the way it's used. All right. One time, it's used in the imperfect tense, which means repeated past action, like... Mary's friends kept asking her to go to the lake. And she repeatedly told them no because she was afraid of the water. This is repeated past events. Every time Mary's friends asked her to go to the lake, Mary continually said no, 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 no. That's imperfect. There's one use in the future tense. People will fall away from the faith. We see this in 1 Timothy. And one time only, it's used in the present tense, which means repeated present action. It's like this. Ever since Joe went to the dentist, he now regularly brushes and flosses his teeth. <laughs> you see, he does it over and over again. That's my story. My dental hygienist says, you have got to floss. And when she was done, I realized that. Ah! I thought, man, she was rough with me. She's normally sweet, but she was rough with me the last time. Okay, and now I regularly, I've got a water pick. <laughs> she said you can do that, so that's good. I'll do it. Okay, so, so the verb matters. The tense matters. This is not a one-time event. When we think of somebody falling out of the faith, there's usually a singular event that happens. Like, a person prays for their sick loved one. They pray hard. And God does not heal them. And so what they say is, I'm done with God. I'm walking away. He didn't answer my prayer the way I wanted. And they say, I'm done. My next door neighbor, I had a conversation with him several weeks ago, and he said, I used to go to church, but I, he, he plays bass. He's a musician. He said, I've gotten jobs where I play in big churches. And he said, I got to peek behind the curtain. And I said, he said, no, it's a bunch of hypocrisy. It's not real. It's not genuine. So I don't go to church. I, I, I don't. I so I don't know if he was ever saved or not, or if he was just a churchian, or how often he went, but he doesn't do it, because he had a situation where he saw hypocrisy. My son walked away from Christ in high school. Why? Because of hypocrisy he saw in high school students that were in a youth group he was doing. It's not real. It doesn't work. All these popular kids who say they're Christians, it's not real. They're drinking. They're taking drugs. They're having sex. It doesn't make any impact in their lives. So this is really important. So I think it's possible that this person is a believer. It does say they have belief. And there's no mention of salvation loss in this reference at all but they continually fall away. Now, here's what's interesting. When you look at Matthew and Mark's version of this account, it's different. It's different. They use a different word entirely. Let me read to you what, what it says. In um, Matthew 12, verse 21, 
And since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution because of the word comes, they quickly fall away. Both accounts in Matthew and Mark say the same thing, exactly the same thing. I hate to admit this, but I think the New King James has translated this better. Derry is so happy right now. <laughs> I read out the New American Standard to please Derry. Um, I got to go. I really think after doing comparative analysis on the different translations, after having examined the Greek, really what it says, and, and properly so, is they stumble. It's the word scandalon. You know, Christ is a stumbling block to the unbeliever. So it's the same word. It's a common word for stumble. Kind of like what our current president does quite a bit. <laughs> Stumbles. And even the Speaker of the House, I guess. Is that, or not the Speaker, but you know. Um, so it's important that we do the work to understand what this is saying. Is it possible that they're not a believer? Yeah, it's possible. Is it possible that they are a believer? Yeah, it's possible. The third example probably indicates a saved person, but they're fruitless due to, to, to things like, like worries and riches and pleasures choking them out. I want to suggest to you, this is the street that most Christians live on. As I talk with pastors, we all seem to agree that most, most Christians who are professing to be Christians live in this third category. They're not producing fruit. If they do, it's very little fruit at all. What all of us want to see is that fourth example. People who are, are optimally responding to the message of the kingdom. They have a good heart. They continue in their Christian walk. They bear fruit a hundredfold, or as it says in... In Matthew and Mark, 100-fold, 60-fold, 30-fold, differing degrees of fruitfulness that we see in their lives. But reality is, there are different responses whenever the Word of God is sown. Now, it's important that we understand that and can accept that. Because what we can do is we can get so wrapped around the axle of the fact that I'm sharing the word of God with this loved one, and they just refuse to accept it. I must be doing a lousy job of sharing the message. So I'm just going to give up. I'm going to give up doing it all together. I'm a lousy evangelist. I quit. I'll just do Bible studies and not do evangelism. No. We are the sower. We should be sowing seeds with the gospel and with Christian growth principles. All the time. Scripture should come out of our mouths when we have conversations with people. But we need to understand, they're not all going to respond in the same way. Because it's not up to us. It's up to God to cause that change to occur. All right. So, how does this relate to us? Rather than obsessing over which soil represents which gospel here in a speculative theoretical debate. It's speculative because we honestly don't know. We should be spending our time spreading the seed so that all can hear in order that many will respond and bear much spiritual fruit. This comes through evangelism and discipleship. We must redouble our efforts to do evangelism and disciple making. So very, very important. Now, regarding fruit bearing, God is the accurate determiner of the fruitfulness, distinguishing true believers from false ones. God alone can read the human heart and ultimately knows the validity of one's true spiritual condition. Number two, we've all encountered people with these differing responses to the gospel, to obedience and to fruitfulness. But we tend to question their salvation based on our opinions, 
Our opinion is they're not producing enough fruit or the right kind of fruit when we can't do that. None of us will ever know how much fruit bearing is necessary to prove someone is a Christian. God alone is the judge. Let me give you an example. I had a friend who was in our father development group at the elementary school my kids attended that I started and um, he came to this program to learn how to be a better dad. His daughter and my daughter were best friends, so he came. When the group was eventually over, after about six or seven years, uh, I invited him to come and be a part of our men's Bible study. And he did, he came. Tracy was his name. I say it was his name because he died. In fact, he committed suicide. Now, Tracy came, probably, because he liked me. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying we do that because of relationships we have. He came, not faithfully, but he would come. But I had him on my 10 most wanted list for salvation. Because I thought, you know, I'm not seeing any fruit. Now, I don't know what's happened in his life. I'm not seeing anything, so I want to pray as if maybe he's not a Christian that he would have that experience. Well, Tracy developed a very debilitating disease that was going to lead to a very painful end-of-life experience. He chose to commit suicide to avoid that. His family was the most important thing in his life. His wife and his daughter, he lived for them. So he went into the driveway of an abandoned house, sat in his car, and killed himself where his family would not have to see it. So his wife asked me, will you do the funeral? I said, absolutely. They had no church, no pastor, just me. Now, imagine you're me. You're asked to do a funeral for a guy you don't know is a believer or not. I've done Christian funerals and I've done non-Christian funerals. I've done several non-Christian funerals. You cannot give the same assurance of salvation because it really it comes down to a probability thing, don't we? Are they a Christian? Are they not a Christian? We're not absolutely sure. But when somebody shows a lot of fruit, we say, I'm pretty sure they're a believer. So you can share. They're with the Lord right now. I couldn't do that with this guy at his funeral. So I had to say, well, the Bible tells us this. And I didn't say it related to him, but they could draw their own conclusions. Very hard to do. I don't know if I'm going to see him in heaven or not. I might. I would be surprised. I would be delighted. I don't know what he did in the final moments before he took his life. I just don't know. I can't know. I don't have the ability to know. I don't have to know. I just have to love him and others and pray that they live a fruitful Christian life. That's what we do. Regarding seed sowing, since we will never know with certainty the true measure of one's spiritual condition. We should proclaim God's word to one another and unbelievers to both ensure and continually appreciate personal salvation and growth. We should be sowing seeds with everybody, whether you're with non-Christians, whether you're with Christians. You know, one of the assumptions that pastors erroneously make is that when they're in a Bible-believing church, that every single person in the seat has made that decision. That is not a safe assumption to make. So there are times when we preach the gospel to one another, because if somebody hasn't responded, then they will. The man that we bought our house from went to the church where I was on staff there, Actually, it was in Stone Mountain at the time. 
He was a regular member of that Bible church. He heard sound biblical teaching every single Sunday. He worked in the sound booth. And when one of the pastor's wives died of cancer, they had the funeral right there in the church. He was working the sound booth. The gospel was shared, and he prayed to receive Christ. We all assumed that he'd already done that. I mean, why be in a Bible church if you're not a Christian? But it finally got through to him. So we preach the gospel to everyone. We want to make sure that the seed goes out. We must not be discouraged from someone's negative response. But move on and keep spreading seeds. This is what Jesus told his disciples. Whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. In essence, he's saying, move on. They may not accept it. Move on to someone else. And that's what we need to do. Now, I'm not saying we should always stop, but there comes a point where you get tired of casting your pearls before swine. And only God can tell you when that time is to totally move on. If you love somebody, you're going to want to share the gospel with them a lot to give them that opportunity. We are not God's sales representatives. Who must close the deal? We are merely God's messengers cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Do you see what a free experience that is to know? My job is not to convince somebody into heaven. My job is just to share the good news. It's the Holy Spirit that does the conviction. And if they reject me, they're not really rejecting me. They're rejecting the God who sent me and his word. So I don't have to take it personally. Our goal as disciples is to share biblical truth, sow the seed with as many as possible and recognize different responses. Except that we're going to get different responses. That's normal. Yep, I did. Okay. So let me share with you some spiritual agricultural factors using this analogy of spiritual growth. Number one, acknowledge the Holy Spirit's role in drawing people towards conviction regarding birth and death. That's his responsibility. Number two, put yourself in a spiritual greenhouse that will allow you to grow as a strong, healthy, fruit-bearing Christian. I have no trouble telling somebody in a liberal church, get out of that church. That is the wrong greenhouse for you to be sitting in. Get into a Bible teaching church. You put yourself, you take responsibility, you're here. Because this is a Bible teaching church. Always has been. It always will be. Are you thankful for that? You should consider yourself blessed that God brought you to a place where you're going to hear God's word. So you put yourself in a spiritual greenhouse where you could grow. Number three, seek out the care of a spiritual gardener who will oversee and nurture your spiritual growth. Find a mentor. Help me to grow. Will you help me? This is so important. Go out and find a mentor. I can show you on one finger the number of people that have come to me and say, would you mentor me? Would you disciple me? But when I go to certain people and suggest this, they jump at the opportunity. Why is this? We need to take the initiative and find a mentor who will help us and nurture our growth. Look for the opportunity to assist others in their spiritual growth. You mentor others. Invite people to meet with you. 
I meet with some people, some guys one-on-one. -on -one. Several of them are pastors because we talk ministry and personal lives. And two of the guys that I disciple one-on-one -on -one, um, are just Christian men that I've known for a while. And they're also in my Sunday night men's discipleship group. So they're going to a Bible church where they're hearing the word taught faithfully every week. They're in a small group where they're hearing the word of God proclaimed and they're interacting about it. And they're asking me one-on-one -on -one as we work through materials and talk about topics. And I can tell you, I've seen both of those guys grow by leaps and bounds. I am so proud of them. Because they are taking it so seriously. I wish I could say that's true of every person I've discipled. I've had people I've discipled who've walked away. But these two guys, they are growing like a weed. <laughs> they, are, they are fruitful Christians. So, this brings us to the point of personal application. Which type of hearer are you? And are you sure of this? You know, you don't have to be stuck in the first, second, or third soil. You could choose to move on and be in that fourth soil if you want to be. Do you want to be? Then you need to do some things to help facilitate growth in your own life. Take responsibility. I should have shared this earlier, but I, I forgot. Do you know that what the average attendance is for Christians in America in church once a month is regarded as somebody being a regular member? Since COVID, it's once every two months. Think about that. Are you putting yourself in a situation where you can grow when you only go to get nourished once every two months and you just go and listen to a sermon and you worship? There's no interaction. And the percentage of people that are engaged in a small group where they can interact is even less than that. As American Christians, we have got to get connected to one another. We have got to put ourselves in spiritual greenhouses. It's our responsibility to do that. And then to be a gardener for somebody else and help them. What can you do to be an even more fruit-bearing Christian? What are you willing to change? What are you willing to do to see more fruit, spiritual fruit, come from your life? And so glorify your father. Share the gospel with others the best you can and leave the results to God. And the word of God in general. Those people you have in your family and you work with, in your neighborhood, don't be afraid to share spiritual principles. They may not be able to accept it right then, but maybe the spirit will take those words and they will see you. Share them. And what should you be doing to assist other unbelievers and immature Christians to grow and bear fruit? Don't run yourself down. Oh, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a leader in the church. Man, who am I? Hey, do you hear Satan saying that? Who do you think you are that you could help somebody else? You can. A leader is somebody that's just one step ahead of somebody else. There are a lot of people that you could be helping. But it's your decision to look for those people and build into their lives. So I leave you with this one final challenge. Sow the seed and nurture Christian growth. That's what we need to be doing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this portion of your word. And we we thank you that you have blessed us to be able to hear, see, understand, and accept spiritual truth. 
Because that's not always been true of our lives. But you stepped in. And Holy Spirit, we credit you for that. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for guiding us into all truth and helping us to understand. We confess that we have been lackadaisical in our own spiritual growth and in our responsibility to nurture others. Please light the fire underneath us to get us into action, to take responsibility in both of those areas, ourselves and others. We want to bring you glory, and we know we do that by bearing fruit. So we ask this. Now wait. This is your will, isn't it? You've said that if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us. And if we know that you hear us, then we know that we have the request that we have asked from you. So I thank you that you will do this. Because this is your will, that we be used in this way. We thank you for this, and we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and our Lord. Amen.